Hello guys, Oscar Hotel 8, Sierra, Tango, November here from Survival Tech Nord. I wanted to put together this short video for our friends down in Texas. Now despite how horrific these events are, they do serve as the necessary context we need to put together a cohesive communications and emergency power plan and the gear required to carry out that plan. Now very often people think I'm out of my mind when I say we need to get out in the field so that we can be prepared with our training when the grid goes down at home. Now to make the most of our field communications practice, we need to stop pretending. There's not a whole lot we're going to learn from these contest-based events. So we need to find some inner motivation, create some initiative to get out there and do it on our own. We really need this impromptu testing at home and in the field. For example, sometimes I just jump on my fat bike, I go out to a nearby beach or forest or pull over on the side of the road. I turn off my mobile phone, I set up my gear, and I simply start operating. Sometimes I'll operate voice communications, other times I'll operate data. But whatever mode I'm operating, I do so with the intent of gaining valuable experience for a grid down scenario. The idea here is simple. Train as you fight. This means we try to approach every training scenario of the so-called hobby from the perspective of our life or someone else's life, depending upon it. The very first thing we must understand is our objectives. Quite simply, this is what we expect amateur radio to do for us in a grid down scenario. Now, my primary objectives are based around coordination. For example, coordinating a rally point or even coordinating the logistics of necessary resources coming to us or going out to someone else. Now, our secondary objective is gathering news and information from within the affected area as well as from outside the affected area. Now, naturally, myself and group members have put together kits for communications, allowing us to achieve these objectives in the field or at home. Now, all of these kits are designed with the idea that if it's too heavy, it's probably going to be left behind. So in the perfect world, we have a high-speed, low-drag kit we can drag along anywhere. That's usually a low-power or QRP kit. Now, despite the output power level of the radio you choose for your kit, the entire kit needs to comprise of everything required to complete your initial objectives. Now, my personal communications plan is based on HF radio. My kit includes an HF radio, a multiband antenna, field computer, battery storage, solar or crank generator for charging, as well as cables, coax, and any spares I might need. Now, statistically, we are more likely to be dropped in the middle of a nor'easter, a snowstorm, or some other man-made type disaster which causes the grid down scenario. With this in mind, my emergency communications kit and plan focus on asynchronous communications. This, as opposed to tactical communications by a rifle team or a squad, carrying out some military objective. Now, these ideas become more straightforward or more pragmatic when we separate tactical communications from communications which will be more valuable in a grid-down disaster scenario. Now, the grid-down disaster scenario in Texas during February 2021 is almost the perfect example for us. Now, we certainly don't want to belittle the loss of life in Texas, but a line in the sand was drawn between tactical communications, communications for personal preparedness, and communications for disaster relief. Unfortunately, 99% of the time when we hear content creators talking about these topics, 
we fail to differentiate between these three. So now, with the grid down scenario in Texas fresh in our minds, I think it's a great time to add the additional context to some videos that I've already published before. So it's extremely important to understand we're not talking about a gunfight. We're talking about reaching out to our friends, our family, our group, our people. And this should be our primary objective. On this topic, I've done a video called Grid Down Emergency Communications for Disaster Preparedness. Now, often when we're talking about emergency communications, we're either talking about disaster relief or tactical comms. This video focuses on people, normal people, trying to reach out to one another. If this is all new to you, that video should be your starting point. Now, I've also mentioned in this video asynchronous communications. Asynchronous communications means communications which aren't in real time. The sender and receiver of the messages or comms aren't necessarily on or at the radio at the same time. I've got two videos of interest on this. This is WinLink email and WinLink peer-to-peer -peer email. Now what we're doing with WinLink is actually sending emails the same way we do with Gmail or Hotmail or any of these other mail services, except we do it over VHF radio or HF radio. Now this gets a bit more advanced than you probably expected but I assure you, it's not impossible. Now, the most hardcore amongst you advancing in your personal preparedness with ham radio will undoubtedly arrive at NVIS, Near Vertical Incident Skywave. Now, those of us employing NVIS in our HF preparedness communications are doing so without any infrastructure requirements or dependencies. We're not using amateur radio repeaters or GMRS repeaters or anything like that. We're talking station to station without any infrastructure. Now, for nearly five years, I've been warning the community about placing our trust in infrastructure, infrastructure like repeaters. Now that we've seen this grid down scenario in Texas, we can understand something with the range of an HT line of sight from your own position is probably suffering from the same grid down scenario which is affecting you. So using NVIS, we alleviate that repeater middleman only needing to ensure our own stations are operational. Now, because we're talking about a grid down scenario or preparedness for a grid down scenario, we can't get away with ignoring power, grid down power for preparedness. And as you might expect, I have a video on that topic as well. Now, the bottom line here is you really can't talk about off-grid or grid-down scenario without talking about our power. We need a way to keep our communications gear up and running throughout the event. Now, emergency grid-down power can be as simple or as complex as you'd like to make it. The one thing I ask you to consider is this. If you can't carry it with you, you're probably going to leave it behind if you have to evacuate or bug out. Now, in contrast to asynchronous communications, we have real-time communications or near real-time communications in the form of keyboard to keyboard chat. Now, on this topic, I have several videos, but I've already shared one with you and I'll now share another one called Portable JS8 Call. Now, JS8 Call is an interesting mode because it allows us to keyboard to keyboard chat with extremely low power over great distances. It's very much like Telegram or Skype or Messenger apps like that, except that we are keyboard to keyboard chatting over an HF or VHF radio. Keep an open mind and check out that video as well. Now, it's important to point out it's not possible just to buy a bunch of gear, store it, and wait for a grid down scenario. Just as it is with other crafts or skill sets, we need to constantly train to keep them up to par. So without context, you wouldn't know that these are actually training scenarios supporting the other topics we've covered in this video. 
That's actually the reason for the strange format of this video. I want to ensure you get the necessary context before watching those others. Now, January 30th and 31st, 2021, I did Winter Field Day 2021. Now, it's not like I really enjoy freezing my butt off in the middle of winter, but I do enjoy putting everything I've learned or taught, at least on the channel, to the test at least once a year during winter. Winter Field Day gives me that opportunity. So please take a look at my after action report from Winter Field Day 2021. Now moving on. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned how field experience will actually help us in a grid down scenario at home. Well, several times a year, I like to take one of my go kits, take my camping gear, and I head out to the field. The point of heading out to the field with my go kit and camping gear is to actually get a realistic representation of what it's going to function like in a real grid down situation, whether that's in the field or at home. Now, this next video talks about my shelter, my camping gear, and my communications equipment on a trip, man portable in Lapland, with my dog. Now, what we learn in the middle of nowhere with the minimal gear we could possibly have is actually how to sustain ourselves without the grid. That's actually the point. So it doesn't matter if you like camping or not. The point is gaining valuable experience about surviving or sustaining ourselves without the grid. Now, I can assure you, Every time I go on one of these trips, I come back with a pocket full of knowledge I can apply to any grid down scenario, whether it's at home or in the field. Please keep this in mind when you're deciding whether or not you're going to watch that video. Now, this last video I'm sharing with you is really all about station strategy. This is another video where I travel to Lapland during the winter in order to test the feasibility and actual capabilities of my low power amateur radio field station and its supporting gear. Now that video is incredibly important because it demonstrates the last iteration of my emergency portable communications go kit. It was a kit based on a Raspberry Pi field station and a Yaesu FT817. Now this video is also important because it kicked off a series of changes, changes which have led to my station as it is today. We'll talk about those changes in an upcoming video. Now for the rest of this video, I'm going to leave you with some tips, especially for those of you down in Texas, to help you get started on this journey. So for those of you who are just planning to get licensed, I would suggest to you skip technician class and go straight to general. This is also true for operators in other countries who have a similar tiered approach to licensing. Next, I would say try to get at least one operator licensed per household. Don't worry about their gear or whether or not they're going to be active uh, initially. This is kind of planting a seed, which we will cultivate later on. Now, there's a lot of bait and switch type clubs and Elmers in amateur radio. Now, really, they don't mean any harm. They're just trying to find newcomers who are interested in the same things that uh, they themselves are interested in. So firstly, don't be afraid to walk away if it's not a good fit. And secondly, make sure you're able to understand and communicate what it is you're trying to achieve with amateur radio. Most amateur radio clubs and operators will be happy to point you in the right direction. So be able to communicate what it is you're looking for. Now, finally, you've got your ham radio license. You understand what it is you're trying to achieve and you're building your kits. Make sure you keep your kits, your gear, all of your equipment as simple as possible. Now, I may have lost sight of this for a while, but there's something to keep in mind. Our goal 
is maximizing our capabilities while minimizing our gear. Keep this in mind moving forward on your journey. So, a huge shout out to the YouTube members and patrons who actually keep this channel moving forward. We couldn't do it without you. Also, thank you to Powerfilm Solar, Pile Up DX Communications, and Super Antenna for sponsoring this video. Rock and roll, guys. Thanks for watching. Ciao.